I looked down at my legs and I was like, hey, legs, come on, just take one more step. And, and they complied. And so this kept telling them to take one more step, just take one more step, just take one more step. And by 49K, I had made up the 18 second deficit on the athlete in third, uh, athlete from Japan named Hiroki Arai. And we were both done. Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? Happy 125th anniversary of Athens 1896. I would like to pretend at this moment to be a Greek prince and present you with a commemorative bowl. <laughs> and I will pretend to be a man. Because no women were at those games. <laughs> no women. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird because uh, T-Bac was in Greece the other week, ready to, to celebrate that. But you have to imagine that the IOC wanted to do something bigger for this. Oh, sure. They wanted to have a whole event in Athens, I'm sure, make tie it into Tokyo, and they just didn't and couldn't. Yeah, maybe maybe Tokyo will do something in the opening ceremonies. I don't know. And they, this was supposed to be an off year. Right. Which would have been so perfect. it would, would have been all big celebration. But So I guess we'll have to wait for another twenty five years to the hundred and fiftieth. <laughs> see what happens. No, we're celebrating hundred and twenty six. <laughs> wow. You know, a lot of people who had big birthdays or big anniversaries. They are doing these, I'm celebrating my, you know, 61st birthday. So why not, IOC? There you go. Why not? Make it up as you go along. Uh, before we get to today's interview, we'd like to thank our Patreon patrons. Uh, this month, if you haven't uh, listened to your bonus audio yet, we've played Mascot Madness, and you got to see who busted all of the brackets and who is the best mascot, supposedly, of the summer olympics it's not who you would expect no but Put it was that very teaser out it's not who you expect it was a very fun competition and we will repeat that in future years you can become a patron at patreon.com slash flame alive pod today we've got part one of our interview with evan dunphy evan is an olympic race walker who raced for canada at the 2016 olympics he came in fourth after some controversy and he has subsequently qualified for tokyo this year at the world athletics world championships in 2019 he won the bronze in the 50k becoming canada's first ever world champs medalist at that event We'd planned to talk with Evan about how the sport works and his Rio experiences, but our, din our interview didn't quite turn out as we planned it. So we're going to start the interview with some pre-interview chat. Uh, Evan was kind enough to listen to a couple of episodes of the show, so I asked which ones he listened to, and that made the conversation go in a totally different direction. Take a listen. Out of curiosity, which episodes did you listen to? Uh, so I listened to the Jordan Gray, okay, which was which was great because uh, I just had a little bit of knowledge myself to to sort of follow along with, and then um, listened to the sort of the IOC session update, not the the executive session update, not the general update. Okay. So I haven't heard to get I haven't yet heard any of your your commentary on the fanning praise for Thomas Bach. <laughs> well, you know, he's doing what he can. We we uh, uh we like T Bach, but you know it is he, it's hard when when he does uh, not like me. Um, oh, which is, <laughs> which is which is something I got to learn through an interview where I was like, hey, wait, he's talking about me. That's interesting. But yeah. Okay, so let let's start with that story. <laughs> what is that about? Yeah, why does T Bach not like you? Yeah. So. When the when the race walk and the marathon were moved from from Tokyo to Sapporo, 
you know, I was, as I am with, with anything I have an opinion on, I was quite vocal about it. And um, it just didn't make sense. And, and there was no rationale behind it. And I had a meeting with, uh, Haley Wickenheiser managed to organize a meeting with the medical lead who wasn't able to answer any of my questions. And, and then I found out that he had just was lying to me about some stuff. And so I was, I was fairly upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did a little little tweet thread basically showing how it just doesn't make sense. And like, it's just, it's, it's, it's optics. It's, it's not for athlete health. It's not playing the athletes first. And it was just this unilateral decision by, by the IOC that no one agreed with. The World Athletics didn't want this change. The Tokyo government didn't want this change. The Tokyo Organizing Committee didn't want this change. And the IOC sort of said, oh, well, we don't care. It, it's not your choice to make. And, and Thomas Bach was asked about it and, and sort of basically just said something along the lines of, well, it's, you know, we're not going, like, we don't make our opinion based on the one athlete who competes well in the heat getting upset. And I was like, oh, that's me. <laughs> I remember him saying that. So now I didn't, I didn't put two and two together there. But yeah, because we did, <laughs> we did talk about that a, a lot at the time. We called it the Mara novella. Because it was, it felt like a, yeah. a South American soap opera, except about the marathon. <laughs> so yes, we did we did discuss those comments. So that's funny now that we kind of know the background for that. Well, and it's interesting because you know, World Athletics had no problem having a meet in Doha, and until people started dropping up like flies in the heat. Even even then, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was I, World Athletics. I think did a fantastic job that that the organizing committee in Doha. Uh, I have like political reasons that the that it shouldn't have been there, but from the standpoint of like how the marathons and the race walks were 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 done and delivered, it was fantastic. There's a few different circumstances that also contributed beyond the heat. You had first of all, we had a race at eleven you know, eleven thirty at night or for the race walk was 1130 at night and, and midnight for the marathons. So that's going to, you know, a lot of people weren't, didn't prepare for that, which is going to lead to more athletes dropping out. Um, you also had the marathon on a looped course and you typically don't get, you know, most marathons are, you know, you, you, you start and you, you get 21 kilometers out into the city and you some at one point you turn around, you come back. And, and so dropping out's a lot more difficult because if you drop out, you're kind of like, Oh, well, now, now what? Now I'm in the middle of the city. Like, what do I do? What do I do now? It makes more sense just to like keep running, even if it's slowly, to make your way back to the you know, to the finish. Whereas on a seven k, it was a seven k loop for the marathon. You basically, you know, any point that you drop out of, drop out at, you're you're at you're close to the finish line. So just the that feeling of oh, this is going poorly. I want to drop out. Oh, hey, my here's the here's my bag with all my stuff in it. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna drop out. the 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 pull to do that, I think, is a little bit easier. So there's certainly the heat was certainly a factor, but we also had athletes in the mar in the women's marathon afterwards who dropped out, and, and you know the media was all, "Oh, this is horrible! It's horrible!" And and one of the athletes said, "Oh, you know, like this the before the race, I knew it was gonna be really hot, so I for the race I decided to try a new salt like con concentration of my drinks, and then I like got cramping and I had to drop out." It's like, yeah, well, you. You know, no one's going to feel sorry for you if you say, oh, yeah, like I put these new shoes on that I've never worn, that I've never tried before. And I got blisters, so I had to drop out. So why are we feeling sorry for people that say, oh, I wasn't ready for the condition, so I tried something new and it didn't work? That sort of, to me, was sort of, – and we had it in the race walk as well. Johan Deniz, the world record holder, basically came – like said before the race, this is – we shouldn't be doing this. It's too dangerous. So he was already – and he was training – like he was doing – he did like a 10-kilometer race walk in his hotel room hot lobby, like just doing like hundred meter laps of like the ho or a, a hotel, like, like uh, within the hotel. It's like, uh, like, so you could just tell that the guys were a little bit like intimidated by it. And then after the race, he said, Oh, I didn't know heat prep. So I didn't prepare for these conditions at all. Like, well, like, come on. Like that's so uh, there was a huge element of that, of athletes just, just didn't take it seriously. And that, that showed. So I, 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 we did, I have all my core temperature data. I was part of the big study that was looking into that. And, and anyone who was part of that study, I mean, it's probably skewed because the people who sign up for that study are probably more towards the prepared edge of, of the spectrum anyways, but no one had came even close to suffering from, from anything with like heats, like severe heat stroke wise. So it was a little bit blown out of proportion. I mean, you have pictures of athletes dropping out 
and looking like hell in every single, you know, single marathon and, and 50k race walk, it's a long way to go. People get it wrong and, <laughs> and suffer. It doesn't matter if it's 10 degrees or, or 40 degrees. That was sort of my take on it was that, yeah, conditions were hard, but it wasn't anything beyond, you know, beyond what was reasonably expected and, and they could be prepared for. And, and all those risks were easily mitigated by preparation. Interesting. Interesting. So again, Mayor Novella, back on. <laughs> so excited. Drama. So one, one last thing on the on Sapporo. What's the basic objection to having it in Sapporo versus in Tokyo? Yeah, so this, this leads me like right into one of the things that I love about my event. So I, the last couple of years, like I've kind of been a bit more disillusioned with with the IOC and the Olympic movements and, and just sort of how do I compartmentalize that with like being a part of it. And, and for me, one of the things I love about the race walk and, and the marathon and, and you know, there's some other events like the, the, the triathlon, the road cycling, all, all the free events where anyone can rock up with their family and take part in the magic that is the athletes competing at the Olympic games. You don't need, you know, you don't need thousands of dollars to take to, to go to the Olympic stadium and see Usain Bolt run, you can get up and close and personal five feet away and watch these events. So to me, that's really important. Like that's the thing that I, I absolutely love about my event that, that anyone can be a part of it and, and come and watch and be inspired by it. So for me, when they took it away from Tokyo, when you took these five events away from Tokyo, especially like the race walks there in the men in the two men's race walks, they're heavy metal favorites. And then the marathon is, is, it's the Canadian, it's like the Canadian equivalent would be the gold medal ice, ice hockey final. Like it's, it's their bread and butter. It's their national sport, basically. So taking that away from Tokyo, who the citizens are the ones bearing the cost of these games, they're the ones paying for it. And you've taken away five opportunities for them to, you know, freely take part in, in the games. I had a huge objection to that. Has COVID changed your mind at all? Since there's going to be a limit, well, even for those free events, you're, you're not going to have those big crowds anymore. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that that kind of like dampens, it makes the compartmentalization that much tougher when it's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not even doing this to like inspire lots of people trackside. I, I'm, it becomes this much more selfish endeavor, especially when you, when, you know, you look at the playbooks and, and it's, it spells it out right there. Like this is a personal decision. You are there is risk involved. You are choosing to do this, that, that like onus becomes a lot more. Okay. Why am I doing this? This seems like a very selfish thing to be doing all of a sudden. So why are you doing it? Because after 21 years of pursuing this, I've kind of told myself it's all right to be a little bit selfish as long as I take like, you know, for me, the, the, the risk matrix is I'm putting myself at risk. I'm willing to, to do that. I just have to make sure I do everything humanly possible to mitigate that risk to anyone else. Um, so those around me, like in Sapporo, um, but just as importantly, like when I come home, my family and all that stuff, like making sure I, I go straight into isolation and, and you know, just to take that risk away um, from anyone else who isn't making that selfish, selfish decision. So I've been wanting to ask athletes this, and we haven't had an opportunity Will you get the vaccine? So that's kind of A. And two, are you concerned about getting the vaccine and messing up training? Um, no to the second question. I will definitely get the vaccine. Um, Canada's rollout is slow um, compared, to, compared to you guys. So it's unlikely that I'm going to be getting my, it depends a little bit. I could potentially get um, at least my first dose before we leave for the games. If things turn out where I'm able to go and do a, a pre-camp, uh, we normally go to St. Moritz in Switzerland to do our altitude training before a game. So if that's still in the cards, then it's unlikely that I'll be able to get my first dose before, before heading out there. And if someone were to offer it to me tomorrow um, as, as an Olympian, I'd say no. Um, you know, absolutely not jumping jumping the queue. My partner got, got hers yes, her first dose yesterday as a teacher. Uh, my dad's getting his first today, and, and hopefully my mom will be able to get hers later in the week or, or early next week. And that's way more important to me because they are all way more at risk than I am. So, yeah, that idea of, of 
remotely jumping in front of you know one person who who needs it um, before I do is sort of in, unconscionable to me. So you mentioned a little bit of disillusionment with the IOC and the Olympic movement. Talk to us about that. Yeah, um, it's kind of been brewing for a number of years now. I mean, there's certainly, I'd say it started with the fact that my event is universally hated by the IOC and they're doing anything they can to get rid of it and they've been successful. Um, So that's certainly an element of it. And then I think this last year, seeing, you know, becoming, I had way more time and less excuses to ignore what was happening in the world. And so with, with all the social movements and stuff like that, I, in the past, as a pretty privileged white male, I've been able to like, be like, oh, I can't focus on that. I have to focus on our world championships next, you know, next month. That's, can't waste my energy, like thinking about this thing which is awful, but it, it, it's, it's what happened. And, um, and last year I was like, I, I can't ignore this. Like I have no, and, and just kind of got swept up in it and, and tried my best to, you know, to learn as, as, as much as I could and just really like listen. And I think that sort of helped to shift my qualms I had about the IOC from that personal level of like, Oh, they hate my event. And like, I believe in my events and so we're at odds with that to then seeing like some of the wider inequities around the Olympic movement and and kind of the 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 messaging that they have versus the outcomes that they produce and being able to kind of understand a little bit more like the Olympics tend to benefit those that already have in their in the communities where the games are hosted and those that are already struggling don't tend to fare very well with with the olympics coming in and and doing its thing and just yeah becoming a little bit more aware of those those inequities and learning a little bit more about the history of you know every oh pierre de coubertin if the pursuit of trying hard is more important than winning yeah that's great but also women shouldn't be a part of the games. And this is for, you know, this is for aristocratic white males, that sort of stuff. Like just, just kind of like pe- peeking behind the curtain, I guess. And then yeah, you know, still obviously like trying, like I still believe in the movement to a certain extent. You know, I, I definitely believe in the power of Olympians. You know, I, I believe that Olympians have this amazing capacity to go off into their communities and to be role models and to inspire and to, you know, to, to be change makers in that regard. But I think I've sort of lost the belief that the larger monolith of the Olympics has that same capacity, if that makes sense. It totally does. And, uh, you know, and I think that's something we struggle with. Oh, Allison, we were on the core, we were on the precipice of Avery Brundage talk, which she, you know, Avery, you know, it, but it's really hard when you have an argument. We know better than to bring up Avery Brundage to me unless we have like five hours. It's really hard when you have an organization that was started by rich white men, aristocratics. They have, you know, and everything is for amateurs because, of course, when you are got a ton of money in your pocket, you've got nothing but to do but to do sports. So we don't want the common folk playing. We definitely don't want women around. And to have these all, all ideals and then you, yeah, when you look deep and go, oh, geez. You know, it's it's really hard to get a body to change when it's made up of people who are accustomed to a certain lifestyle. I think. Yeah, I agree, and and, and I think you know they the the messaging they do fantastically. <laughs> like you, you know you like like so much credit to to how you know how they've been able to um, you know position themselves for one hundred and twenty five years. Um, it, what's remarkable to me, or what's I guess what the the most recent sort of learnings that I, I've kind of ventured down is this idea that like okay yeah like women weren't included because someone went hey it's a good idea to include women women were included because 
women started their own thing and it was like super successful and the IOC went, ah, that's a threat to us. We should probably just incorporate them. And like, same with the interwar period with, um, you know, with, with the, the Bolshevik games and, and these like giant, giant Soviet, like multi-sport games that were bigger than the Olympics. And they went, ah, yeah, hmm. that's going to be a problem for us. Like we should probably like let everyone compete. It wasn't these idealistic, like, oh, like we need to do this to be good. It was like, oh no, we need to do this to survive. It just, I, I find it really interesting. And, and I think it is really hard, like, to have that opinion and then also be like, well, no, and I actually like, I have the Olympic rings tattooed on my calf. And like, there are, you know, there are elements that I believe in and, and like, it's obviously, you know, what I've pursued to do for my entire life. So it's, it's a tricky balance sometimes for sure. Right. Because you're still an athlete. It's still the pinnacle of athletic competition. It's still the best in the world showing up. And yet it's an organization, international monolith, all those things that cause problems. So to, to live with that. Yeah, exactly. It's, and, and like I was having this conversation with my brother last night is I, I'm a bad example because I have never been one for the, you know, for the razzle dazzle of it, like the, the ceremonies and, and, and all that stuff. Like I, at the world university games, uh, opening ceremonies in Shenzhen, massive stadium that just, 80,000 people in there and I have pictures of me just passed out like full on asleep during this during the ceremony like I've never never been someone that that's like that's been a relevant thing so people always ask like that's the one question you always get asked by people is like oh like how was walking the opening ceremonies I was like oh we, we don't do it like and like athletics being a second week sport we're we're not we don't get to go to the opening ceremonies and it's just, and people are like oh that must really suck I'm like yeah but like it's mostly just you just stand around for a few hours and you walk through the stadium where you can't really hear anything and you wave to people you can't see and then you sit down for three hours it's like I I don't get it <laughs> and and so for me like the Olympics has always been in my mind an opportunity to compete against the best in the world and so it's never been any different than me than like a world championships or, or to me it's just all right I get to stand on the start line with the best people in my event in the world and I get to test myself against them. And so for, for on the one hand, like that's why you know, I, I'm upset that there's no fan, that there will be no, like no international fans and, and my family and friends won't be there. And, and there'll be limited number of domestic fans because for them, I think it's like, it, it, it's unfortunate. Like I want them to be able to enjoy it. But for me personally, it's not, it's not going to be less motivating or anything like that because I still get to stand on the start line next to those same, you know, those, those exact same guys and, and test myself. Uh, and that for me has always been like the biggest motivator. So let's talk a little bit about then your experience in Rio and just what that was. So obviously you didn't go to the opening ceremonies. We watched it. Uh, we were in Juiz de Fora for our, our pre-camp and we had our athletics team got all dressed up in our opening ceremonies kit and watched it from a room in our hotel and then um, went up onto the roof and took some pictures and stuff. It, it was, it was fun. I think it was actually probably more enjoyable than, than, than having been there personally. How was being in Rio in general? Because obviously it got some mixed reviews. You know, we we're talking about kind of the haves and the have nots of being in Brazil. Again, like I'm a terrible example because so I raced, I came into the game. So we came into Rio, I think two days before the 20 K event. So I was sort of in my bubble, raced the 20 K And then I had a week between the 20 K and the 50 K and basically it was just, you know, didn't leave. I didn't leave the village. I went to the stadium once to watch Usain Bolt's hundred meter final and and Wade Van Niekerk break the 400 meter world record. And, and that was exhausting. And I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do that again. Uh, I think we got back to, to the stadium at like from the stadium. I think the bus left at like midnight and we got back to the village at like one, one o'clock in the morning, something like that. I almost got in a fight with an American sprinter. Um, Like it was just, it was exhausting. So then I just stayed in my, so I I didn't leave the village after that and then had the 50K race. And then like two days later was the closing ceremonies. And by the time the 50K ended, everyone had already done the fun tourist things. And having just raced 50K, I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go climb the steps to, uh, (laughs) you know, to see, uh, um, you know, to see the, the big Jesus. And I was like, yeah, I think I'll just, I'll stick around here. So I, I did nothing 
outside the, outside the village. So I can't really say um, I had a blast, um, you know, watching everyone's sports on TV up in our athlete lounge and getting to talk to, you know, watching cycling and being like, Hey, wait, you're a cyclist. Tell me what's happening. And like learning, you know, learning the ins and outs of track cycling and, and, and all that stuff. Like for me, I was in heaven with that. Cause I'm just a sport nerd. So I love that aspect of it, but I didn't get to see any of Rio. So can we talk about the 50 K and, and what happened there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what do you want to know? Well, just, okay. So you, you were bumped during the race and Canada appealed and then Japan. So there was a, there was a lot of controversy around the final standings. Yeah, certainly. So, so I'll back up, uh, a, a little bit. So, so in the 20 K race the week before I had finished 10th, that was by far my best ever performance, uh, at a in a, sort of at a world stage. And I was kind of like, sweet. I was ranked I think 12th going into the 50 K. So I was like, ah, sweet. I've already done better in a race than I was supposed to do. So I've kind of checked that box. Um, so going to the 50 K I was kind of like, man, like, all right, like, let's, I don't know. Let's just like, see what I can do. Like no one thinks I belong up at the front, but I know that, that I, that I've been going, everything's been going really well. And like, let's just give this a chance. Let's give this a try. So my goal for that race was literally just walk with the leaders until I couldn't anymore. And so if I, if I dropped out at 40 K because I had killed myself trying to stick to the leaders, that was going to be fine for me. Like I was, I was prepared to lead to, you know, feel successful in that, in that circumstance. And so the race started and I, I did exactly that. I, I placed myself up at the front. I got a little carried away and ended up like walking off the front and leading the race until about 40 K, which was bonkers. At 40 K got passed by, by the top three and spent the next 5k just kind of feeling sorry for myself. I was like, oh, like I'm in fourth, like those guys ahead of me, I got, I'm not going to catch them. Like they're going, they're too far ahead. And uh, the guy behind me is too far behind. Like he's not going to catch me. So like, I'm going to finish fourth. And like, Hey, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and I just, just oh, it was such a weird attitude because I was kind of like very complacent, but I was also like, this is amazing. And like, but also still I have 5k left to go. Like, what are you doing? Like focus. So at 45K, I kind of like snapped myself back in. I was like, well, hey, what are you doing? You told yourself you were going to come here and fight with those leaders until you couldn't walk another step. So what are you doing sitting back here feeling sorry for yourself? Like, go catch those guys. So I looked down at my legs and I was like, hey, legs, come on, just take one more step. And, and they complied. And so this kept telling them to take one more step, just take one more step, just take one more step. And by 49K, I had made up the 18 second deficit on the athlete in third, an uh, athlete from Japan named Hiroki Urai. And we were both done. Like we were at the end of our, of our rope three hours and 37 minutes into the, into the, into the race under the hot um, Rio sun four and a half minutes to go. And we were both just like, where's the finish line? Get, you know, um, neither of us could walk in a straight line. And, and I kind of had that idea of like, all right, I'm going to go past this guy and I need to like, make sure I like finish him. So I need him, I need him to like hear me go by him. I need to, you know, let him feel my breath as I go by him, which was a very bad idea when neither of us could walk in a straight line. And so, you know, we got a little bit too close and, and he ended up sort of, you know, veering into my line. Our arms got, got tangled up and it was so minor. It was one of those things where if it had happened 10K earlier, you would have just been like, what are you doing? Go away. Stop. Stop touching me. But because I was so internally focused on telling my legs to take one more step, to take one more step this one little thing that just proprioceptively like grabbed my attention. I went, Oh, what's, what's, what's happening. And my legs went, Oh, we're not being asked to do anything. We must be done. And my legs just sort of like, like buckled. And I can actually remember it, it's, I remember people after the race being like, Oh, he faked it. He faked it. And I was like, I thought that was so funny. And then I watched the video. And I was like, I can see why people think that. Cause we kind of bump. I take about two more steps and then my knees buckle. And all, that all happens in the matter of you know, a fraction of a second. But I can remember in my head that whole process, you know, like when there's like, like a trauma and everything slows down. I have that weird slow down feeling in my head from, from this moment of, my, of the bump happening, my brain going, huh, what's happening? And then my legs going, we must be done. And then me looking down at my legs and shaking my hands at my legs, telling my legs to keep going. And, and then sort of managed to, so managed to like keep on my feet and get to the finish line, completely coll like collapsed across the finish line. And 
you know, I, I, I had 50,000 meters in me and I didn't have 50,002 that day. And, and, and I was pretty stoked about that. And I was a little bit delirious as well. Um, I kept asking to go through the media mix zone and our, our head coach kept being like, no, you are, we are not putting you in front of cameras right now. <laughs> not to be trusted. I was like, what are you talking about? And then I found out that they were like appealing. They were like the track officials were looking at what had happened and this, that, and the other thing. And so there was, a pretty long delay with the final, with the initial decision in. So we go through the process. I, I get, I'm in doping control. So I, I'm in the doping control room. Hiroki's in the doping control room. He comes over to me and, you know, this is before anything's happened. He's not been disqualified. We don't, no one knows what's going on. And he came up to me and through his translator, like apologized for what had happened. And, and, you know, we chatted for, for a couple of minutes and it was so genuine. Like I knew, then and there that like whatever happened which i was still unsure of like wasn't done on purpose and and so it was just this weird feeling of like his when his name got taken off the the the, the bronze medal sort of placard thing and my name got put up and it was just like oh man this, this doesn't feel right and wrote, um jared talent and matte Toth, who finished second and first like are good we're good friends of mine and i remember just sort of standing around getting ready for like the flower ceremony and being like this just, just doesn't telling them like, this doesn't, I don't like, this doesn't feel right. And eventually made my way back to the village and got to go look at the video and was just like, Oh no, like he barely touched me. Like, we're not appealing. We're not like, this is oh this is after Hiroki had been reinstated. So we had the final right of appeal. And, and I, so I basically told the lawyers at, at King Olympic committee, like, no, like this is my decision. I will make this decision. Like when I'm ready, let me go eat because <laughs> I haven't eaten since the race ended. And then I will go and watch the video and make a decision. And I saw the video once and was just like, this is what we're talking about. Like, no, like this is, we're not, he's not, we're not appealing this. And that was that I kind of thought like, okay, cool. Like that's, that's fine. And hours later, our media person for Athletics Canada was like, Hey, Evan, like you need to like say something like people want to hear from you. And I remember my response to him was my parents are here. Who else watched? <laughs> And so I had no idea that, that CBC at home had, you know, had ended up like carrying most of the race live and that this thing had kind of become a thing back home. I had no idea. So the whole thing was just, it, it was insane to me, but it was, for me, the most important thing was knowing that all of the people that I raced against would have done the exact same thing I did and, and all thought it was crazy that it was even a question of appeal. And those are the people whose opinions kind of matter the most to me. And, and at the end of the day, like my, I was super successful. Like my, I, I didn't need earlier in my life. I certainly was an athlete. I got into sport because I wanted to win. You know, I, I defined my, like I defined success by winning. And that was that, you know, that came to a head, not making the London Olympics in 2012 and worked for years of a sports psych to really get rid of that attitude. And for me, Rio was, the culmination of all that work because I was able to say, well, no, look, I don't need this medal to define my success. You know, I, I had a goal going into this race. I met that goal. I checked every box that I wanted to check. I had the best race I've ever had. You know, I, I don't, that met, I don't need that medal to tell me that I had a good race. And that was huge for me. So, so for me, like more than anything, that race symbolizes the, the progress that I've made and sort of the growth that sports you know, allowed me to have, which I, I'm really, really proud of and happy to have. Thank you so much, Evan. You can follow Evan at Evan Dunphy on Twitter and Insta, and his website is dunphywalks.com. We'll have links to all of that in the show notes. Next week, we'll have the second part of Evan's interview and actually talk about the sport, too, so don't miss out on that because it is also fascinating. I love when someone is willing to tell us stories. I know. I know. It was great. I, I mean, like, we go in thinking we're going to have race walking talk, and we actually have Mara Novella talk. It's been forever. I know. Mara Novella has been on hiatus pretty much uh, almost all of quarantine. Mm -hmm. We've barely gone back to it. So it's like, I feel like we're the Netflix show that took the really long break and hadn't been able to film during quarantine. And it's been, you know, 18 months since the last episode aired. Like like Game of Thrones, there was that long break oh, between right, the right. last two seasons. So now we can get back into it and it's, the, and it's we're back. 
the Mara Novella is back. I know. And it's amazing because we keep talking to people who are like, oh, man, uh, we're not so worried about Tokyo because Beijing, oh, that was hot. Atlanta, oh, that was hot. And this is the only one where they went, oh, we're moving the marathon. And uh, you know Coatsy just was like, I have had it up to here with criticism. We are <laughs> moving this marathon. I have a solution. It's done. You think Coatsy has a boomerang in his jacket pocket? <laughs> I don't know, but he should whip it and bring that marathon right back to Tokyo <laughs> and, and, the, and the race walking. You know, that would be interesting because I know nothing about Brisbane. Mm-hmm. I, do, are we going to have to worry about heat there? But it should be their spring, right? When, or yeah, their it, it'll be sp- yeah, if they have it in July, August, you're talking about end of, end of winter going into spring. Oh, so so we're not be... going to have a heat issue. Okay. No. Too bad. Because I'd like to see what he'd say when it's his own country. <laughs> John Coates, I'm talking to you. All right. Why don't we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive? Welcome to Shook Flistan. Team Keep the Flame Alive, our uh, past guests of the show who are now citizens of the, our country, Shuk Uh Let's start off with uh, John McLeod, our uh, Olympian and film producer, uh, had a nice write-up in Swimming World magazine about his uh, documentary on Steve Jentner, which we have seen. Very good. I'm very happy he got more notice for that. Yeah, it's quite a, It's quite an excellent documentary. Modern Pentathlete. Samantha Schultz was featured in an article by the Army News Service, and she's competing in two World Cup events in Bulgaria uh, in a, uh, so April 7th through the 11th and 15th through the 18th to help maintain her world ranking. And despite having already qualified for Tokyo, she must still be formally selected for the team. Which really stinks. It's so many of these people have qualified, but now it's probably, I assume it's because they had the year off of competition and the federations want to make sure that they are still at the right level. But still, that's nerve-wracking. Right. And when we talked to Philip Dutton, there was also a question of when they're putting a team together. Mm-hmm. Y- you qualified, but you're there's probably more athletes that qualified than the country can send. Or he got the quota spot for the country, but he doesn't necessarily get to fill the quota spot. It's like Right. So there's all these different politics and setting up things that have to go on that just oh the athletes just want to go and compete and do their best they don't want to play politics like this right and it's so hard because it's really interesting to see all of these events get crammed into a a very tiny uh time frame because so many sports don't have qualified athletes yet and their qualification system is based on rankings and points and all of a sudden all of these ranking events and points events are gone so, so many athletes who thought they had time to work the system and, and time to get their qualification, they don't have that anymore. And it's really hard because, and they went to that because a lot of sports also said, hey, a one-off event, if we had a bad day and we're the best in the world, that really s- stinks for us. Right. It's yet again, another complication from COVID. Is there anything that COVID made easier no, I don't think no. so. The longer we are in this COVID, the, the worse it gets, really. Oh. Finally, a Team Schuster with our curler John Schuster is competing in the World Men's Curling Championships. So there are 14 teams, and they compete in 13 round-robin games, and then the top two teams advance directly to the semifinals, and then the next four teams below that uh, compete for a spot in the semifinals. And they are still in the round-robin stuff right now, Currently, it's Tuesday, April 6th, and, and Team Schuster has a 5-3 and three record. So there's still time to watch. Finals are on April 11th. Hopefully, they will do well. But honestly, they, the uh, sportingnews.com has a list of who won the last 10 world championships. Canada and Sweden have each won four. Norway won one. And the last spot is covid COVID won one of the world's champions. Yeah, COVID beat all of us. Right. So it's the U.S. hasn't been in this spot before, but hopefully they can pull it out and at least get to the semis. Well, they had an amazing Pyeongchang, so you would hope that that would still yeah, push and they've them been, on. Yeah, they've been competing pretty well. They've had some blowouts. They've also been blown out. 
but uh, they've had some really good games so far, so good luck to them. Before we move on to our next segment, I wanted to remind you that Book Club is coming up. We are reading the book Foxcatcher. You can get your copy at bookshop.org slash flamealivepod. When you purchase through bookshop.org at our site, we get a commission from books, and that goes toward funding our on-the-ground coverage at Beijing 2022. We are constantly adding new titles to the storefront, so continue to check it out and buy your books from there. Thank you. It is the 25th anniversary of the Atlanta 1996 Olympics, so every week we are looking back at some of the stories from these games. Allison, it is your turn this week. What do you got for me? I'm doing something kind of different because I came across an article from 1996 in the Christian Science Monitor about what happened to the excess food. What? I know. So at the time, there was a lot of controversy that Atlanta was shuffling off its homeless people, that they were pulling them off the streets, that they were knocking down some very low income housing to make way for the uh, the Olympics. Mm-hmm. So I came across this article that a group uh, called Atlanta's Table had coordinated with the organizers to collect the excess food from both the village and Centennial Park and redistribute it to soup kitchens and homeless shelters and to the people who need the food. So over the three weeks, you know, a little bit before, a little bit after, over 500,000 pounds of food were collected and redistributed. And it only got more difficult to do this because of security. The volunteers from Atlanta's table could not actually get into the village. Oh, And then after the bombing, it was even worse. Mm -hmm. So they had developed this whole chain to move the food to a place where they could collect it. So the, the Olympic volunteers were involved in this as well Wow! to getting this excess food to them so that it wouldn't get thrown away. They were working out of one warehouse. They spent about a hundred thousand dollars, which is nothing in this kind of operation and distributed 500,000 pounds of what would have gotten thrown away. Wow, that is amazing. So Atlanta's table did just, they originally only had five trucks of their own. They borrowed trucks and had volunteers from other organizations around the country come down to Atlanta and help them with this enormous logistical task. Wow. Can you imagine? Like, we need more trucks. Uh, We got, the weightlifters didn't need today. They had to make weight. Uh, We need more trucks. (laughs) Right, and there was a lot of, they were saying there were these they kept getting these, their favorite were these pre-boxed lunches, which I guess were prepared for the volunteers or other staff so that if those didn't get eaten, they didn't have to do anything. They could just take that box and hand it right over. So those were their favorite, apparently. Wow. That is amazing. Hey, it did some good. That's You know, 500,000 pounds of food will go... We'll go pretty far. So this very small organization called Atlanta's Table just really did something amazing when the Olympics come to town. Because we so often we hear about how locals are put out. Mm -hmm. And especially in Atlanta, there were so many stories about that. So it's nice to hear that the the Olympics did bring some benefit immediately to the much less fortunate in the city. Very cool. Very cool. All right, let's look at what's going on with Tokyo 2020. You know what's so exciting about this week? What? Nobody from the organizing committees made a sexist comment. (laughs) Oh, but there's sexism. We've got some sexism updates. (laughs) Oh, did you hear, though, that they are not going to replace the uh, opening ceremonies director? Who made the Olympic comment? <laughs> I have read this in, in several uh, news stories, but apparently they were like, yeah, we're far enough along with this. We can, we can go on without having anybody. We in the know the opening ceremonies has been cut way, way, way back. Right. Well, you know, and, and I'm not I'm surprised that the IOC has not come out and said, oh, look, more cost savings. Yeah. Who's the Olympic now? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
Okay, well, this is that's a great segue to talking about the first item. But according to North Korea's Sports in the DPRK Korea website, it has said that uh, North Korea is not going to p- compete at Tokyo 2020 because of concerns about COVID. And then the IOC has said in a statement that they had not been formally told by the Olympic Committee of the DPRK, so they don't know what's up. And this is according to Inside the Games. And let's be honest, the DPRK probably was going to boycott yeah, Tokyo. Any, I mean, I, this is a nice excuse. Yeah, they don't really get along with Japan. Yeah. But it puts a little cramp in the whole make peace with South Korea movement that you know T-Bock loves. Are we talking at all about 2032? Yeah, yeah, I know. They've been talking about doing it. Well, how, I mean, that also does not... Yeah, you can't boycott 2020 and be like, by the way, we'd like to have the party at our house. So we'll see what happens with that. Torch Relay news. So the Torch Relay has gone through Nagano Prefecture. And interesting torchbearers of note included astronaut uh, Kamiya Yui and 2018 curling Olympian Yusuke Morizumi, who was inspired to take up curling when watching the 1998 games that were in Nagano. We love those stories. And then today I saw there was a robot handoff. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, Akito Gota, who is an engineer at Toyota, he carried the torch. He has he has invented this robot to des, that is designed to increase mobility for those with impaired movement. So he was running with the robot, which was very cool. When the torch went to Honda in Aichi Prefecture, the flame was carried on a traditional Chintoro boat to celebrate Honda no Haru no Dashi Matsuri, which is a festival to welcome spring, and that's been celebrated since the 17th century. Now, here's where sexism bit comes in, because the Mainichi Shimbun newspaper reported that organizers were forced to make a late change in who got to be on the boat, because women traditionally have never been allowed to be on this boat, but uh, that got soundly criticized, so they let a few on. There's a long history of not letting women on boats, that they're bad luck for boats. I did not know that. Yeah, it, it, if you go back even to, you know, American and European sailing history, it was bad luck to have a woman on your boat. But then why do they name the boats after women? Well, there you go, because the woman is the thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. <sighs> but it's amazing how all these, how these, I don't want to say microaggressions, because I, I, I don't want to take that word, but these kind of small pieces of sexism keep coming out. In Mm -hmm. all this Tokyo planning, like, oh, guess what? That's sexism. That's prejudice. That's bias. You know, we're kind of calling this all out, which is fantastic. Yeah, and they're making changes for Tokyo 2020 because it's the Olympics and the whole world is watching. But are those changes going to stick? So next year, when they celebrate this spring festival, will there be women on the Chintoro boat? You know, if it mobilizes Japanese women, that's the key. Interesting. All when right. They, when they say, no, this is this is not okay. And we can say it's not okay. I hope so. Next week, the torch is supposed to go to Osaka, but the Kyoto News has reported that there is talk of it not happening because there has been a rise in COVID cases in Osaka. We shall see about that. Tickets, if you're in not Japan, and <laughs> and have CoSport as your authorized ticket reseller, you may have gotten an email that said, oh, you could hang on to your tickets and transfer them over to friends and family if you would like, or take your chances that, that uh, tourists will be allowed in to Japan at some point. I had a, a quick message with uh ken hanscom and he's like yeah and it would be a violation of your agreement to resell those tickets so this is going to get messier and messier yeah so that has to be i have to decide that in like a day or two what Oof. to do i don't know it's so frustrating i don't even want to think about them taking 20 percent of what i've spent and you know we all have 
we have one friend in the entire country of Japan. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I imagine that sending it to you Japanese family and friends is not really an option for most people. Right, right. <laughs> And then the the International Paralympic Committee has suspended its zero classification policy and will allow athletes in 10 sports to be graded in the host city before Tokyo 2020. So usually all the classifications have to happen before a Paralympics. And because of the tight time frame with COVID, the IPC has allowed these 10 sports to have their athletes be classified and graded before Tokyo 2020 so they can be there and get classified and you better hope you make it I guess right or maybe I guess if it's a lot of the uh, track there's so many classes and they've kind of know the classes so that it's not going to get too screwy but yeah this could get this could also get a little tricky exactly exactly um thanks COVID yeah, right again right it's amazing that there's no more real good news from Beijing. I know they're doing some ice test events, but like everybody else is quiet. And it's so weird to have so many games be quiet. I think they're keeping their heads down, to be honest. Yeah, right. Oh, man. Nobody wants to, because that's the one who gets shot. <laughs> the one who sticks their head above the, the, <laughs> the, the hole. But it makes me wonder, when is Beijing going to like announce their medals? You, you know, because they, they haven't done any yeah. of that kind of stuff. So they have to release their medals at some point. But are they going to wait until July? And just there's going to be a barrage of stuff happening in August, September. Probably September if they want to uh, avoid the Paralympics, too. You know, and maybe they're going to use this to really concentrate and intensify the buildup. You know, usually we have a good steady year buildup. Mm hmm and this may be, you know, crunch it all into three months and just full throttle the whole way September through. We shall see. It'll be I'm interesting. Exhausted just thinking about it. I know. I, know. <laughs> I was watching the wrestling trials over the weekend, which, oh, by the way, U.S. wrestling trials, our very own superfan Sarah got to say hello to and take a selfie with the dulcet tones of Jason Bryant. So it was just awesome to see Shook Fostan meet in real life the diaspora coming together right <laughs> but the the trials were pretty intense and also intense was the amount of team usa commercials because that stuff is all starting they are really starting the nbc here is really starting with its barrage of marketing to to remind you that the games are coming up i'm ready man I'm i've got my too. my oreos I've got my puffs. I am in training now. All right. Well, we should get back to another session. It's two a days now, from now and through the, July. Oh. <laughs> and oh. the... <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think about race walking. Email us at blamealivepod at gmail.com or call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208 Flame It. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta, and keep the Flame Alive Podcast group on Facebook. Join us next week for part two with Evan Dunphy. And as we go out to music by Archdale, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.
who's the Olympic now? 